probably breaking some law getting Tori to hand those out, I'm sure. So let me do a couple of uh, things before we pray. Firstly, Ruby uh, would have loved to have been with us, but we've got a family thing on. So uh, she thought willing I'll be here next week. How great it is to be together, isn't it? Tremendous after looking at Zoom. Uh, and uh, it makes you realise how beautiful heaven will be because uh, heaven's about face-to-face -face fellowship with the Lord Jesus and not doing it by remote. Uh, I have to laugh uh, how our governments don't understand the gospel, do they? Because we've all got to sign in and I wonder where the QR code is for the Holy Spirit, um, whether he's uh, got to have a <laughs> COVID test if we all get into trouble. And then we sang in that second hymn where we were allowed to embrace one another. Well, you're not allowed to do that. So even though we sang it in the hymn, we're not supposed to be touching each other. But uh, it's great to be together and to be able to, uh, to worship. So uh, let's bow in prayer. Almighty God, we come once again to sit under the authority of your word. Pray you would teach those who need teaching, encourage those who need encouraging. Rebuke and correct those who need rebuking and correcting that we might do all for your glory through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Both last week and this week, you really need to have read the sermon notes I get the guys to send out because uh, we're doing so much. This is such a big passage. It includes a couple of stories, a couple of songs, and there's a lot of background stuff that obviously and the time that's available to us, uh, I can't cover. Uh, that was probably even more so last week. So if you haven't read those notes, uh, for instance, at the end, I put in a table um, of Mary's song and how that's dependent on the Old Testament. It's particularly dependent on Psalm 103 that Carl read for us earlier in the service, and also 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah's song. And, of course, there's many parallels there because Hannah couldn't have a child. She pled with the Lord. The Lord enabled her to conceive, and then she sings. Uh, in some ways, it's a bit more like Elizabeth's circumstances here in the story, but there's many parallels between 1 Samuel chapter 2 and this story here. But what I want you to think with me about this morning is a God worthy of your praise, love, and service. Now... You might wonder why I didn't put God is worthy of your praise, love and service. But I particularly put it this way, a God worthy, because uh, the gospel is this challenge to who is the God in your life and my life. You see, the bottom line is, and you young people, your children and teenagers need to particularly get hold of this. There's going to be a God in your life. There is a God in your life right at this moment. Every one of us in this room. Every person in sale, every person in Australia, every person on the face of the earth has at least one dominating God in their life. Many have many different gods, but there is one God that you are committed to, that I am committed to intellectually. That is, even if you haven't thought about it, you'll, you have subconsciously, what is and who is that God? And the question becomes that, can you trust on that God? Can you depend upon that God? Is that God really worth your time and your service, your energies and your possessions? And that's the biblical story. That's the story that starts way back in Genesis because Satan comes to Eve in the garden and he says, don't let this God who made you be your God become your own God. And, of course, in sinning, she and Adam do that. They reject the rulership, the kingship of God in their own life, and they take on their own godship and, and, and but seek to become their own god. But, of course, in doing that, they make other things. Uh, it might be other people. It might be possessions. It might be power. It could be a myriad of things. God in their life. And ever since Adam and Eve plunged humanity into that state, that's still the ultimate question that faces every one of you and every person on the planet. Who is your God? 
And is that God someone or something that you can really, really trust when it gets to the critical moments in life? When everything's going smoothly, of course, that might be fine. But when you come to the great issues of life, and particularly that great issue of death and what stands on the other side of the grave, does the God you're trusting in help you at that point? And that's the point in which all false gods or, uh, fail because they cannot give life and hope on the other side of the grave. And the biblical story, and you see that in the passage before us this morning, is about a God who really is worthy, first of all, for your praise, because the gods you serve are the gods you praise. They, he's a God who is to be loved. God is not just to be praised in the sense of being feared. He is to be feared. You and I are to have reverence and awe for the God of the scriptures. But at the primary core of the biblical story is love, isn't it? Remember, Jesus has asked that question, what is the greatest commandment? He doesn't interestingly say to reverence God or to fear God. What is it? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And that brings you back to this point, because what are you doing with the gods in your life? You are serving them with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. You see that in the world round about us. People who give themselves to their career or they give themselves to their family. They have this goal. They have this objective. They're going to own so many houses when they retire so they don't have to depend on their super fund or they're going to get this or, or get that. And, and whatever it is, they're going to be, you know, world champion at some sport or, or whatever their, their particular God is. Loving God and serving God. The bottom line, is, bottom line is, as you and I go through life, and we're putting energy just into life itself, what you and I are doing, and, and you young people, you need to really get hold of this, you're putting life and energy into serving a God, whether that's the living and true God or the false God. And the bottom line is it's a tragic thing when men and women spend their whole life serving a false God who can't help them at the critical moment when they're dying and they don't know what's on the other side of the grave. Now, it's not just saying that we serve God because we're afraid of dying. There's, there's far more to it than that. But that's the critical point, which you often see where the false gods most clearly let people down. And as you read the story of the gospel and you come in these opening chapters of Luke, you come face to face with the God of the Bible. And the, the point of the story is that this is a God who really is worth loving and serving and giving your life for. This is a God who's to become the driving force in your life and in my life. This is a God who you, you can pour your energy into and your time into and you can pour your money into your, and your talents into and he's not going to let you down. He's not going to fail you. He's going to be there to walk with you as Carl prayed before in Psalm 23 through the valley of the shadow of death and he will uphold you. So what sort of God is this? Well, we see in this story, not just in the second part, but in the whole two chapters and the whole scriptures, of course, God is a God who acts. And this is significant and important because in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, as you read the stories of the Old Testament, and particularly the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, and particularly Jeremiah, but also Isaiah, when they talk about these false gods, these false gods are gods who can't act. Remember Jeremiah's great parody in Jeremiah chapter 10, where he mocks those who follow the false gods? And he has that, the NIV puts it this way, your God is like a scarecrow in a melon patch. Now, that's something that could have been written this week, isn't it? Because you all know what scarecrows are. Children, you know what they're there for. You've seen them in the field sometimes when you drive around in the country. They're there to frighten off the birds. And they might look impressive. Sometimes people go to great detail in making up scarecrows. They don't just get a broom and put a sack over it or something, you know. And, and they might put dangly things hanging off it that the wind blows so it rustles it. But it can't move. It can't really see the birds that it's trying to frighten away. 
It can't go boo and frighten the birds away. It's deaf and it's dumb. Read, dumb. Read Jeremiah chapter 10. Or I've been reading Jeremiah refresh and, and my own uh, readings this, the, the last few weeks. And just yesterday, reading, um, if I can find Jeremiah, reading uh, Jeremiah 51. And uh, he does the same thing again when he's mocking these false gods. Can I get there? Jeremiah 51 and uh, verse, well, let's start at uh, verse 14. The Lord Almighty has sworn by himself. You see, there's a God who speaks. I will surely fill you with men as with a swarm of locusts. He's talking about Jerusalem being and Israel being restored after the judgment. And they will shout and triumph over you. He made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom, stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters and the heavens roar. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Every man is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idol. His images are a fraud. Why are they a fraud? They have no breath in them. They're just images. They're as dead as this piano. They're as dead as this lectern. They can't speak. They can't act. They can't hear. They are worthless. The objects of mockery, when their judgment comes, they will perish. And so Jeremiah paints this picture again of the stupidness and foolishness of idols. Contrast that with the God who acts and speaks. Let me read a couple of those verses to you from, uh, from back in Luke. To Abraham and his descendants, even as he said to our forefathers, you see, God speaks. He acts. He doesn't act like a robot. He acts as a living person who speaks. And again, when Zechariah's song, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, God is a speaking God. And that's the first and, and perhaps the greatest contrast. The, the idols that the world calls you and I to live and to follow, and particularly, again, I say this to you young people, mum and dad are bringing you up in the faith and teaching you about Christ. The world saying, oh, don't believe all that nonsense. Don't believe in Jesus. Don't believe all that stuff and that old dusty book, the Bible. It's got nothing to do with relevance. Uh, the modern world, come and follow these idols. Those old idols are false. They're dumb. They're deaf. They cannot speak. And also God not only speaks, but he works. Notice again here in verses 51 what Mary said. Notice the he has is here. Verse 51, he has. Verse 52, he has. Verse 53, he has. Verse 54, he has. God acts. Dumb idols can't do anything. Sure, they might give you a bit of popularity right now. If you chase the dollar, it might make you a little bit richer than the person next door and you can have a bigger house and a third house and a fourth house and a boat and a jet ski. And a, I see a, a reading on the web yesterday, seven people, was it, in Australia bought Rolls Royces in um, November. I've got two customers who turn up in Rolls Royces, 600,000. One guy paid for them, 750,000. The other guy paid for them. And they all look very nice, but they're just a car. They don't go any faster than my broken down old Ford Ute, really. And uh, God acts. You, you want to serve a God who acts. You want to serve a God that can be involved in your life, that, that wants to work in your life, that the, the power of the Holy Spirit is poured out into your life as you trust Christ to change you and to make you more like Christ. God is a God of power. Notice here in verse 49, Mary calls him, the mighty one has done great things for me. You see, God acting. Who is God? He's the mighty one. Three times in Luke 1, God is called the most holy one. He's the one who is raised above the affairs of men. And he reigns in heaven. But he's not just sitting in heaven watching afar through a set of binoculars at you and I saying, Oh, gee, there's Ross and he's in trouble again. Let's see how he handles this. He's come down into time. He's come down to this earth in the person of Christ. 
He's present here by the power of the Holy Ghost to work in your life and my life as you and I trust in him and follow him. You see this wonderfully in this story, don't you? I've got there on the screen. Who needs an ultrasound because of God's power? Now, why did I put that there? Well, we have two predictions in this story earlier on last week, both given by the angel. And what does the angel say to Zechariah? Your wife, even though you're old, she's going to conceive and you're going to have a child. No, he doesn't say that. You're going to have a son. A son. And when he comes to Mary, he says, you're going to have a what? A son. Both times. God speaks through the angel and says not just that the woman involved is going to have a child, but specifically they're going to have a son. That is, God is the one who is powerful and who acts. And whether it's through the natural means of conception, as with Zechariah and Elizabeth, or it's through the unusual and miraculous conception that is, happens with Mary, God speaks and he acts because he's the mighty one. And he's so mighty, he's able to name the child before it's conceived, isn't it? You will have a son, Zechariah, and you're going to call him John. You will have a son, Mary, and you're going to call him Jesus. It's interesting to jump ahead, actually, to chapter 2 for a second, because many of you will know the story in Matthew, and remember how Joseph's perplexed about the birth of this uh, child or the, the pregnancy of his, his fiance because he knows he's not the father and he's thinking, how can he quietly divorce her? You know, you know put some background to that story. Mary's heard she's going to become pregnant. What does she do? She rushes off to the back hills of Judea. She goes up the back of Dargo somewhere where she doesn't really know anyone except Elizabeth. And for three months, she stays there. And she comes back to her hometown after three months and you can't hide a pregnancy, can you? And as it becomes obvious, as the baby Jesus grows in her womb, she's pregnant. And Joseph realizes this. Did Mary tell him? Well, we don't know this. So, but remember, the angel appears and says, don't divorce her. Tells her that you will call him Jesus, Emmanuel, for God is with us. But look at chapter 2 of verse 21. On the eighth day, now we're talking about the birth of Jesus here. When it was time to circumcision, circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. So this is long before, before Matthew, uh, Joseph knows about it in Matthew. This is going back to the earlier story in Luke chapter 1. Even before the Holy Spirit has come upon Mary, God says his name's going to be Jesus. And his name's going to be Jesus because he's a boy. Why can God be so sure this pregnancy is going to be a boy and not a girl? Because he's the mighty God who's in control, who speaks and acts. And it's that very God that calls you and I to worship him. He's no dumb idol. He's no blind scarecrow in a melon patch. He's no God of chance and luck that just spins the dice and hopes it happens. He's the living eternal God. But he's also a God of faithfulness, doesn't, isn't he? And you see that as these stories unfold, particularly in Mary and Zechariah's song. So notice that he's a God who remembers. Both Mary and, Ze and uh, Zechariah mentioned this. In verse 54, it's Mary. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. And in verse 72, to show us mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Now, when you read remember in the Bible, you've got to understand what remembering is saying. Sometimes we use remember, you know, just to remember. My son turned 40 on uh, Friday, and that's where Ruby is at a family barbecue thing today for him. And hopefully I'll get there to get the last sausage eventually. But 
And so at those times we say, remember, you know, remember he was placenta previa and Ruby was in hospital for six weeks and he was, a, so I can remember all that, you know, I remember seeing him, he'd just been cut out of the womb and he was still all covered in blood and you can remember all that stuff and remember some of the good times and not so good times over 40 years. We, we do that, you know, as we reminisce, we might say. But in the Bible, remember's used in a different way. Oops, I remember I left the oven on and uh, if I don't get up out of church now and go straight home, the house might catch fire. Or you're coming to, you know, you're, you're going to school and I remember I left the children's lunch uh, on the bench, so you turn the car around. Remember in the Bible always has that sense of doing something because of what you've thought. For us, that means you often a mistake. Uh, oh, I remember I didn't... Uh, shut the door or I didn't lock the dog up or whatever and so you have to change what you're doing that's the idea here not that God's made a mistake God doesn't make mistakes but he remembers his past word and that then promises uh, causes him to act you know guys you're coming home from work and you promised your wife you'll pick up a loaf of bread or a, or a, a um a bottle of milk or whatever and you're nearly home and you suddenly remember oh, I said I'd get that you've got to turn the you've Remembrance drives your actions. So when the Bible is saying here, God remembers, he remembered what he promised and now he acts. Remembrance always leads to action and God acts to keep his word. Why? Because he's a God who keeps his promises. You see, here you come back again to this guy, idea of false idols. Idols make all sorts of promises. And people in our society swallow those promises all the time. If I just had this promotion at work, or if I just had this experience, or if I could just have this holiday, or, or whatever things. Now, those things in themselves are not necessarily wrong. But when they are part of the idol's presentation to you and I, that you will find in those things the fulfillment, the satisfaction, the whatever you might be chasing then they've become an idol and they will be broken promises. God is a God of faithfulness. And of course, as I said last week, you're seeing here the fulfillment of all those promises. Carl read from Psalm 89. That Psalm is about the God fulfilling his promises. What, did, what does the Psalmist say? David himself, you promised to build me a house. Here we are a thousand years later and God is fulfilling that promise. He's a God of faithfulness when it comes to helping. He has helped his servant Israel in verse 54, remembering to be merciful. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to have a God who's involved in your life who can help. And the reason you and I need help is because life is bigger than you and I. Disease, sickness war, poverty, the, the list is long. For many of us in Australia, of course, many of those things are, are removed because in, in one sense, I hate this phrase, but we do live in a lucky country in many ways in this land. But for many people in the world, that's not the case. And even though we have such a, a blessed standard of living and prosperity in so many ways in this land, life still throws at you and I things that you are not able to deal with yourself and the false idols of this won't help. Remember Alexander the Great. Children, if you don't know who he was, you go home and look him up on Wikipedia, but he was the great uh, Greek general that conquered much of the known world, even went into modern day India with his troops. He died at 33 years of age and he was buried with one hand out of the grave to show that even the great and the powerful go to the grave with nothing in their hand. It basically conquered the known world. But his power and his riches and his prosperity could not help him at that moment. But God is a God who helps. And this is the point of the parody of those of Jeremiah and Isaiah, and particularly in the other Old Testament writers. The scarecrow in the melon patch can't help you. It can't hear you. It can't see you. It can't speak to you. The God we have is a God who speaks, who hears, who acts. And he's a God who keeps his promises. 
It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, as he said to our fathers. Oh, a God who keeps his promises. He doesn't say it will be easy, but as Second Corinthians shows us, my grace is sufficient for you. I will be with you. I'm not going to make your path necessarily easy. In fact, for some of you, for the Christians in Libya and the suffering church we've been praying for, they're walking down a very difficult path. God doesn't promise to say suddenly he'll stop all the persecution, but he says he will be with them. And he says the same thing to you and I. He's a God who walks with you, who walks by the Holy Spirit in you, who helps and guides and directs. He's a God that you can trust. I've told you the story before two years ago. Some of, some of you won't hear it. It, it. You know, as someone that's been pastoring churches on and off, on and off, and and uh, my one escape from Melbourne during COVID was to go to Camperdown and take a funeral. The saddest funeral I've been involved in was lovely Christian guy and his wife in New Zealand who had a baby uh, born at um, 36 weeks and she only lived for two days, little Rachel. And my friend Paul, he's an elder in the Presbyterian Church in New Zealand and, and he's a great big Dutch guy, six foot four that way, about six foot that way, a builder. He's got the quietest voice. For such a big guy, he's amazing. Standing at the graveside with the body in a shoebox, little baby body in a shoebox, having to put that in the grave. For me, that was the hardest funeral I, I've ever been involved in. At that stage, he was at another church and the pastor took it, but I was involved as well. But it's at that point God's there to help. And it's that point that the false idols of this world cannot help. Your money, your success, your fame, your self-interest, your pride, it all vanishes at that point as you stand there looking at an empty grave, burying a two-day-old baby or baby burying a 50-year-old wife or husband or a grandchild or whatever. God is a God of mercy. You come to this and you read this here. Time is nearly gone. I haven't got Ruby to yell at me, but Tori promised she'd fill in for him. Tori gets really red in the face when she gets angry, so I'm a bit scared of that happening. So let's push on. Look at all the references to mercy here. Verse 50, verse 54, verse 70 to verse 72. It comes out again and again. God is this God of mercy. And what a wonderful thing this is, because I know in my life, and I'm sure you do, that you need mercy, that you need grace, that you need forgiveness. You and I need it in our human relationships. Those of us who are married know there's times when there's need for mercy. You come home, Dad, and you've had a difficult day and you're grumpy and, and you're tired and you're thinking about all those work issues and all those emails and things that are already stacking up for tomorrow and you walk in the door and your darling wife says, how are you, honey, and you mutter and grump something. And, and you and I need mercy and forgiveness. Mum, when you're tired and that little one does something for the fifth time that day that you've told them not to and you finally lose the call and yell at them instead of just picking them up and loving mercy and forgiveness you and i need it at this level but how much more do you and i need it at the vertical level with god and what's poured out before you here is a god who's full of mercy you can come to him you don't hold back there is a throne of grace, as Hebrews says, where you can come 24-7 and you find mercy. You've screwed up again. And you've not only offended your wife or said the wrong thing at work or, or said something wrong to your children, but you've offended God. And you can come to him and he won't turn you away. You, you go out into the the veggie patch where you've got your scarecrow and you kneel down in front of your scarecrow and you say, oh, scarecrow, Mr. Idol, I've done it again. 
And Mr. Idol doesn't hear because he's got no ears. He might have ears painted on him, but he can't hear. And he can't see that you're lying prostrate before him. But the living God sees all that. And this is why he's a God worthy not only of your praise and your love, but your service. Because he's willing to pour out upon you and I grace and forgiveness. The whole biblical story, of course, is summed up by Zechariah, where he says, praise be in verse 68 to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come. See, this is the God who acts and a God who speaks and has redeemed his people. Redemption, salvation, deliverance from sin and from Satan and from death. The three great enemies of mankind. God has acted and he's acted to deliver. He hasn't just written a book. He's come in a person. And that person went to the cross and died. And as we sang before, shed his blood. Oh, here is mercy that gives you and I reason to bow before him in wonder and praise and adoration, love, and to rise up in thankfulness and go into service. Zechariah puts it so well, doesn't he, at the end, as he thinks of Isaiah chapter 9, to shine on those living in darkness. Verse 78, because of his tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, that's Malachi, of course, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. He not only redeems you and I from our sin in that sense, but he leads and guides through life. It's not that I come to know Jesus and I have this experience of where Christ reveals himself to me and, and I come to know him. And then he says, okay, now you're going to heaven, Ross, but the next 50 years, you know, you're on your own. You might be a 12 or 13 year old here this morning and you come to know Christ and then Christ says, well, I wait for you at the other end like a marathon. No, he runs with you and I, doesn't he? Along that marathon, along that journey. Light for life. Not just salvation, but light for life. And the, the daily battles and struggles. That's when the farmer puts the scarecrow in the melon patch. He sowed his crop. And his crop's coming up and it's starting to fruit. And at that point, the birds did a sin. Driving out to Stephen and Carmen's yesterday. And, and you know where they're just before you turn off to the road, there must have been 300 cockies sitting in one paddock just devouring whatever they were devouring. If you ever needed a scarecrow in a paddock, it was right there. God's there to walk with you and I. And with us as a church, there's light for life. Psalm 23, of course, is about that. The Lord is my shepherd. But the psalmist doesn't stop there, does he? He then works through the scenarios of life to the end of life where Christ is with him. Well, you and I, every one of us right now, we're serving a God, maybe not a number of gods. The question is, are you and I serving the living God and serving him alone? It's not that we serve God here and we have these other gods as well. It's love the Lord your God with all your heart. You don't leave a little bit of your heart over to hang on to those old gods or the gods of this world. You give your whole heart to God because he's a God who is worthy in his person and his glory and his majesty of our praise. He's a God who deserves to be loved because he's loved you. Because John says in 1 John, we love him because what? He first loved us. And of service, out of thankfulness. We come to the end of another year. I know Christmas is probably in June and all that. But as we celebrate the incarnation and as we look forward to a new year, who are you going to serve in the new year? Who is the God that's going to dominate your life, direct your life, guide your life? Is it the one who shed his blood on the cross for sinners? Or is it one of the false gods of this world that promises you stuff that it cannot deliver and at the great moments of life will fail you and show itself to be nothing but an empty idol? And, you know, as Jeremiah says in that passage in Jeremiah 51, the goldsmith 
is embarrassed by his idol. The scriptures are clear. This is another sermon, so let me not get too sidetracked. You become like the God you serve. And if you, if you serve idols, you become like those idols. You serve the living God and like Christ, you seek to become like him. Let us bow in prayer. Father, we are humble that having rejected you and our forebears, Adam and Eve, turned away from the living God and so quickly embraced the false idols that Satan offered to them in the garden, despite all the beauty and glory and the peace and the majesty of the garden, that you should give us a second chance, as it were. Lord, you could have rightly and justly and properly and correctly just left us to follow the foolish idols of this world. But you've come. You've come in Christ. You've come to pay the price for our idolatry. And you've come to overthrow those idols, the idols of this world, whether they're selfishness and pride, possessions or power or pleasures, or the list is long, far too long to pray through. You want to overthrow all those idols and become the supreme God in our hearts, not just in this life, but for all eternity. Now, Lord, here's the great difference. Hell will be full of idolatries. Heaven will be full of only those who worship the living God. We thank you for your grace and mercy, for we do not deserve it. Left to ourselves, we would still be following the foolish idols of this world. But in humbleness and thankfulness, we thank you for Christ. And we worship you, Father, in his name. Amen. Thanks, Ross.